Just and true forever. This is who you are, merciful and faithful, high priest forever. Merciful. Merciful and faithful. It's who you are. Who you are.
Hello and good night. Good evening, I should say. Sorry. I <laughs> uh, hope everybody's doing well. I hope you've had a good week. Um, I've had a busy week, so this is actually a relaxing thing for me. Might not sound, seem like it, but for me, this is relaxing to talk about something I'm very passionate about. And I'm very thankful all of you are here. I'm thankful for those of you watching online live and those of you who will be watching it in the future online. To all of you, I say thank you for being here. Um, tells me a lot about you that you're here. It tells me that you want to go toward everything God has for your life. Am I speaking everybody's heart here? Yeah. You don't want to mess around. The, the days are, are getting crazy. Time's getting short. And it's time for us all to get plugged in to what he put us here for. Right? So tonight I hope that that's going to be the case. Um, I will tell you uh, a couple of disclaimers. Number one, many of you have heard me speak several, m multiple times. Uh, I've preached a couple times here at Belmont. Not all of you are from Belmont. So... So that means that some of you will be hearing some of what I say for not the first time. Now, from my experience, um, when God has me hear something repeatedly, it's because he really wants me to get it. So if you're hearing it again, please don't think, oh, poor Joseph, he doesn't know he's repeating himself. It's because I know there are people here hearing it for the first time, and so maybe you will be hearing it for the first yeah, it, it might take seven times to soak in. Thanks, Vicki. So, uh, second disclaimer. <clears throat> um, you are your message. You know that? Your life is your message. And if you're a teacher and your life is not the best set of examples that you can give to illustrate what you're teaching, then you're just giving information. There's no impartation from a teacher unless they are their message. So I'm all the time thinking that I need to be a destiny person. I, my life needs to be a, a life of destiny. If I'm teaching about vision for your life, I've got to have vision for my life. So you will hear stories from my life tonight. Not a lot, not long stories, but it is impossible for me to teach without bringing my own stories because that's what you're supposed to do as a teacher. You're supposed to draw from your own life. If I'm only giving you stories from other people's lives, I'm just giving you information. I don't want to give you information tonight. I want to give you impartation. Is that okay with you guys? So those are my disclaimers. So the format tonight, um, we're going to do this tonight in, in two parts. There could be about five or seven parts for this topic, but we're giving a one night kind of condensed thing. The first part, I'm going to give you some principles about having your vision statement. Uh, some will be practical, some will be spiritual principles, but they're things to keep in mind as you're developing your vision statement. And then the second part will be actually creating your vision statement. We'll talk about the elements that make it up, uh, what does it look like, and at the very end, I'm going to let you get together in pairs and each of, for just a few minutes, and each of you share what you've written with each other and give each other a little bit of feedback. And we will stop at 8 o'clock in terms of online. But if anybody wants to stay and ask questions, I'm here to stay all night and talk about this stuff because this is my, my, my thing, this is my passion. So I don't want anybody to leave feeling like, oh, I, don't, I still have a lot of questions, I'm not sure. I mean, it's okay to have questions, you can call me, you can email me, I'm happy to give my information to any of you. And online. You guys, if, if there's anything I'm saying that, because you're obviously not here to raise your hand and say, hey, um, if you need any kind of further information, just contact either Mimi or uh, Rachel or somebody here in the offices, and they know how to get in touch with me, and I'll be happy to connect with you as well. So you are very much a part of us. We, I'm, I'm not forgetting that behind that thing on a tripod back there, there's, there are people watching. So I want all of you to receive tonight. All right. Yes, ma'am, you may. What we're doing tonight? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you're not a believer, you're not connected to the one who birthed you with purpose. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I have and I do. And, and it's, it's a great thing to stir them up with. And I left my spoon at home. Shoot. Almost always teach with my big wooden spoon. But uh, it, that's a great question, uh, Deborah, because we tend to think, oh, these are spiritual topics and these are secular to- topics that they wouldn't be interested in. Au contraire. Um, I found more often than not people that don't know the Lord, they've got so much curiosity and so much questions. And it, then so often we walk in fear toward them. We don't want to offend. We don't want to push them off. And so we don't share anything. That's wrong. So absolutely. I love to ask people, what are your dreams for your life? I never start out, well, are you a believer? Okay, well, then I can talk about this. No, I don't do that. I just, tell me about your dreams for your life. And I, in my spirit, I'll get the spoon out. I'll start stirring them. So great question. Absolutely for everybody. Because God created every human with vision. He had a purpose. When he thought of us before creation, it says in Ephesians, that means he made decisions for our life. He made unchangeable decisions. He made your physical appearance when your spirit was going to go into your body. He thought about what your body would look like. He thought about your parents. He thought about your personality, your wiring, the things we talked about last week. He made all these loving decisions for our life because, also says in Ephesians 2.10, there were works he created for us to do. The problem is too many people get their identity from what they do. And if they don't know what to do, they feel like, oh, my goodness, I'm not pleasing God. God's not happy with me. And if I don't work, I won't get paid. And we approach God as though he's our boss instead of our Abba Father. So, yes, there are works he wanted us to do, but he wanted us to do them as sons and daughters. All right? Now... I'm just going to talk kind of general and then give you these vision keys. The, uh, by the way, have you ever dumpster dived? I remember a few years ago, somebody was telling me they were dumpster diving to get food. And I'm like, I, and I, I really, you know, I just went off on them. I'm like, that's so stupid. I mean, goodness, that, that's awful, terrible. A week and a half later, I was behind the Belk store in Bellevue or the Macy store when it was closing And it was a big, long dumpster, and it looked full. Yes, I was in it for an hour and a half. And this is one of the things I got. Now, shes I'm sure she needs Jesus, but this is a great thing to use. Because it's it's heavy and sturdy, see? Okay, um, David, I hope you can pick this up. Uh, I don't want to stand like this. Maybe if I put it in front of this. Can, ever, can, can you see it in the very back? Can you read all the words and stuff? Yay. Because last week I was using a thin pen. I used a little bigger pen and darker colors, so maybe this will work this time. Don't look at this just yet, okay? Because I'm going to explain it. But you can write if you want. But if you can, if you can multitask, you're better than my better man than I, Gunga Din. All right. The vision for your life needs to be catalytic. Your life is to be like a domino in a long line of dominoes. Your life is supposed to have an impact on history. There's no human life that is not called to make an impact on history. How could you not make an impact when Jesus lives in you? And everywhere you go, it's Jesus going with you. And going in a store, going to get gas, going to the bank, everywhere you go, every step of every day, Jesus, with all of his power and authority, is in you. And we forget about that. And we we forget who we are. And so your life is supposed to be a domino that impacts the world. And uh, you've heard of the butterfly effect? I don't know how accurate that thing is but the butterfly effect is this idea that a butterfly flapping his wings the wind that it creates has a chain reaction of events and that it ends up causing what a hurricane in another part of the world or something I've not looked at it but I like the concept of what we think is a small action when God breathes on it can transform the world I'm expecting that And we all need to expect 
that our life is meant to change the world. Now, whether we see it or not, it's not necessarily that we have to see it in our lifetime, but when our last breath, we have to know in faith that our life is impacting the world and we'll find out about it when we get to heaven. Make sense? Okay, God's vision for our life is to reign, to rule and reign. From the Garden of Eden, when he gave man authority over the earth, that's why he had man name the animals, so he would understand he had authority over them. And anything or anyone you give identity to, you have authority over. And anyone or anything you allow to give you identity has authority over you. God's original plan for us us from the Garden is that we would walk with him with his authority and power, and that we would take reign and dominion over the earth. Now, there's a lot of theological debates about kingdom reign on earth and all that, and I'm not trying to get into a theological thing because I would lose because some of these guys, what they know just blows me away. But I do know we were called to reign. But in order for us to reign, we're called to know him. What did Jesus say in John 17? He said, this is eternal life, Father, that they know you, the only true God. So I'm going to read, I'm going to just remind you a couple of verses. I'm going to blitz through these, all right? Uh, You can always go online and get them later uh, if you want. Philippians 3.12, Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Christ Jesus took hold of you for a reason. Don't go without finding out what it is. Joel 2.28, in these last days, God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And what it looks like when his spirit is poured out is dreams and visions. It says, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will have visions. I said in church recently, if the older generation stops dreaming, then the younger generation is going to struggle finding vision for their life. If you got breath in you, there is still dreams God has for you. There are dreams, in fact, I'll say it this way, there are dreams God has for you that you couldn't have done when you were younger. You were meant to do them now. I just saw this the other day. I thought this was awesome. Do you know what is the most productive decade of someone's life? There was a big study from one of these highfalutin universities. You know what, one, what the biggest or the most productive decade of your life is? Take a guess. 60s. The 60s. Praise the Jesus. I love that. Um, Not that I'm in my 60s. Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, famous passage that Jesus quotes in Luke 4. Uh, It's where he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to... And then he gives a list, preach good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, comfort those who grieve in Zion, proclaim the day of the Lord's favor, the uh, vengeance, the, the year of the Lord's favor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, he said. And if you died and Christ lives on you, in you, that means the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. Do you know this? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. Turn your, tell somebody next to you, spirit of sovereign Lord is on you. You guys at home, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. And if his spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you, it's then you have been anointed for a purpose. And the same things Jesus was called to, we're called to as well. We're called to preach good news to the poor. We're called to bind up the brokenhearted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4, God chose us in him before the creation of the world. We were carried around, you know, what is it like a... a not porcupine, the, um, not penguin. What's one of those animals? Possum, one of those pea animals. You know how a possum has lots of babies they carry around for a while? God carried us around. Before creation even started, he had all humanity in his being. And he carried us around. He chose us before the creation. He didn't just carry us, he chose us. Romans eight twenty nine. we are predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Your vision must include looking like Jesus. 
your vision must include any, whatever you do, whatever you nail down, this is my laser of my life. It has to include looking like Jesus when you do it or why do it. It's not about drawing people to you. It's about drawing people to him through you. Um, John 15, 16, Jesus said, I chose you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Uh, Colossians 3, 12, we are God's chosen people. He chose us. And let me, let me wrap this up for you. You've been chosen. You've been predestined. You've been anointed. You've been called. And here, here's a word. It's not exactly in a verse. It is in context. But I want you to think of this. I thought of this the other day. I was like, that's good. I was telling somebody. Sometimes I'll be explaining stuff. I'm like... What did I just say? That's good. Because I realize it's not me saying the Holy Spirit is giving me stuff. You are envisioned. You are envisioned. You see, the reason why it's so important for us to have a vision is because we were created in the image of a God who had a vision and we're it. And his dream is that in Habakkuk 2, uh, 2.14, that the whole earth will be filled or covered in another version with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is God's vision. This is God's, and we are his vision. So we are created in his image. So we are called to live with vision and purpose and destiny and to go toward something. We were never called to just twiddle our thumbs and, and survive. We're more than overcomers. I read a secular history about Paul. His last words as he was being carried through uh, Rome to be killed on a hilltop overlooking Rome. Four centurions guarding him. People are, are spitting and throwing things at him and yelling and screaming at him. The presence of the Lord was so thick on, Peter that t on Paul that two of the centurions fell to their knees and received the Lord. They were immediately taken away and killed and replaced by two more. They got to the top of the hill. The presence of the Lord was still on him so strong. The other two of the first four fell to their knees, accepted the Lord, and they were immediately killed. And, and there was a rock where they cut off their heads. And so Paul just went over there without a word and put his head on the rock to be, whatever, beheaded. And the, the commander he couldn't accept this. He says, Paul, bring him over, bring him over. He says, Paul, what are you doing? You're a smart man. You don't have, we don't have to do this. This is stupid. He says, he says, this Jesus is dead. You, you, Caesar is your Lord. Don't, 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 you don't have to do, we can stop this right now. This could be yours. Without a word, he goes and lays his head down again. The commander says, no, bring him here. He says, he says, Paul, let's stop this. This is ridiculous. And he pointed to a statue on the top of the hill of Julius Caesar. And underneath it was the word conqueror. He said, Jesus is not your Lord, he is. And the last recorded words of Paul were, according to secular history, more than conqueror. When we live with that identity, that assurance, the, world, the word says we are. I'm not making it up. I'm not emotionally trying to stir people up to something not true. That word of God says you're more than conqueror. The word of God says greater in you is the, than the one in the, that's in the world. So we were envisioned to walk through this life as Jesus did and expect things to change. I'm editing stories I would love to tell you about having that mindset and going in a place and, and the, seeing the spiritual atmosphere of a place change. Not because of me, because of me believing what the word of God said about who's in me. I'm dust. I'm weak and foolish. And if God can use me, he can use anybody, right? All right, so. Um, I love Charlie Brown. About four months ago, I was in uh, picking apples in Sebastopol, uh, California with Joseph Maloney and Carter Pinto and other folks you might know. And uh, in the town next to that is where Charles Schultz is from. And Joseph Maloney was a friend with Charles Schultz's grandson. 
And so we went to the Schultz Museum, and I saw all the Peanuts gang and all this stuff. And uh, do any of you know that Charlie Brown's success rate at archery was 100%? Did you know this? I mean, he was terrible at kicking the football because Lucy would always fool him, and he'd fall for it every time. But in archery, he always got a bullseye. You know why? He would shoot the arrow and then draw the bullseye around it. <laughs> this is what writing your vision statement is. You're aiming where to go, and you're saying, this is the bullseye that I'm going for. Okay? So be Charlie Brown's. Um, here's something. I, 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 uh, I'm saving that for the later. Um, I want you to keep something in mind. When you get your vision statement and you're walking toward it, you will have doors closed, guaranteed, because we have an enemy, right? It's so important to remember a closed door does not mean a no from God. Sometimes it means a keep asking and not letting him go. Like Jacob, when he's wrestling with the angel on the, on the stairway to heaven, says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And as a result of that wrestling, a couple of things happened. One, he had a forever remember in his hip of that wrestling with God, but he got a new name. God wants to give you a new name, and that new name is tied to wrestling with God and not being satisfied with no all right, I, I just, that's just a free little thing to throw in. 90% of what God has for your life is his general will. Uh, if you go back to listen to Dan's message on call, the first of the seven series on call, he gave a great intro overview of things that we're called to, that, are, that he was giving a list of the general things we're all called to. We're all called to hospitality. We're all called to uh, care for the widows and orphans. We're all called to know the word, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 90% of God's will for your life is general and is true for all humans, all believers. 10% is unique for you. 10% is specific for your life. But if you're unfaithful in the 90%, you'll be confused about the 10%. So if we pursue, oh, just tell me what to do. Are you faithful to what you already know to do? Are you faithful with the 90%? Um, your vision is about possessing the land. Your vision has to be about extending the Father's kingdom on this earth. If it's not, it's not a, it's not a vision worth having. You see, if you're in the kingdom of heaven, then everything about your life needs to be about extending the Father's kingdom. I've said before that, that for one kingdom to grow, it has to be at the expense of another kingdom. And so if you're not kingdom of God minded in pursuing your vision statement, what do you need Jesus for? What do you need the Holy Spirit for? You know, it's all about finding a cool thing to do in your life. Uh-uh. The price paid for you was too high to do that. So that's just kind of some general things. Um, and now I want to talk about some keys of destiny. I'm very mindful of our time. I'm going to make sure if it's the last thing I do at 8 o'clock, we will be finished. You guys back home, you can run get coffee anytime. But we'll have a break after a while, after we do this. All right, I'm going to give you some keys to unlocking or releasing vision for your life. I tried to think of one word things to summarize them. So number one, pray. Now that sounds, duh, of course. Yeah, yeah, go on to the next one. Think of it this way. There is the rhema word and the logos word. The rhema word is hearing from the Holy Spirit and that comes in conversation. When you pray, Pray about, pray for God to unlock his dreams in your life, his dreams for your life. Pray for open eyes to see things that are hidden. I love Proverbs 25, 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search for it. 
So God has hidden things in you. And sometimes he wants you to just pray and ask him. It's not that God is a... uh, hard to please or any of that. He loves the fellowship. We have no idea how much God, his favorite thing in the world is hanging out with us. God is, love is not just a a something he does now and then. It's who he is. It's in every thought he has for your life. So when you pray, pray for wisdom. Pray for revelation. Pray for your eyes to be opened. Pray that your life will step into those things he thought about for your life before the creation of the world. And don't be satisfied until you hear. You keep praying it. Quick story. I came home from my discipleship training school in, uh, in Australia, and I, uh, I had sold everything and I, I, before I left, and I had no idea what to do. I had no money, no car, no job. And staying, I think it was at that moment, was on Jeff Sweeney's couch. I've stayed in so many people's couches and garages and basements and attics and cars. And so I came to church and who would be speaking there but John Dawson, a future international president of Huawei, a good friend of Papa Don's. He was preaching on destiny. And I'm sitting in the pew and if you saw me, I would be like, you know, I always take notes when I'm somebody speaking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. On the outside, on the inside, I'm like, God, what do you want me to do? I, I sold everything. I don't have anything. I just, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And God said, do you know why green and blue are your favorite colors? <laughs> don't you love when you ask God a question, he answers you with a question? I'm like, okay, I'll humor me, God. Why are green and blue my favorite colors? I always... By the way, my first word as a baby was flower because my grandparents had this big garden and I helped out and I've always been about that or loved that. I said, no, why are green and blue my favorite colors? He said, because every flower before it blooms is green first and that's you. You help things bloom into what I've created them to be. I said, cool. What about the blue? He said, the blue is the water that feeds the flowers and causes them to grow and that's me. So you and I work together in my garden where no two flowers are the same shapes, sizes, colors, or smells. That's who you are. I want you to notice an interesting thing in that. And this is all tied to your vision statement. There are two questions every human wants to know for their life, whether they consciously or subconsciously ask it, but every human who's ever lived wants to know, who am I and why am I here? Here's the problem. Because we've let the world shape our concept of God and ourselves, we try to answer the second question first. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. You're never going to clearly get what God has dreamed for your life to do until you clearly understand who you are in him, how he sees you and who he is. And the key to seeing how he sees you is knowing him. Because you're made in his image. You know the creator and then you're going to start to be able to understand his creation starting with you. Remember Psalm 139 when David said, your works are wonderful. Oh God, I know that full well. Was he talking about rainbows and waterfalls and peacocks and tropical fish? He's talking about himself. Your works are wonderful, oh God. I know that full well. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your vision statement has to start with that. With the assurance that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't have to compare myself with anybody else. God didn't make a mistake when he made me. He doesn't owe me an apology. Think about this. Who do you see as your competition in your life? Is it the darkness or the light? God made you uniquely, wonderfully. And if you don't have a clear concept of who he is, you need to get in your knees, get on your knees. Say, Lord, I need you to show me how you see me. I wish I had a lot of time to tell you a lot of stories from mine and other people's lives of of that very prayer and how he answers it. He loves to answer that. Because he always wants us to know how he sees us. Number two, 
Number one was the rhema word of God. Number two is the logos word of God. Have you noticed that as you go through life, there are certain verses that kind of bubble to the top. They're like your life verses. You're like, wow, that one is, I'm sorry, I'm claiming that for me. One of mine is uh, Hebrews 10, 24, why I use my spoon. Let us consider how we might stir one another up to love and good deeds. That's my verse. I'll let you use it too, but it's mine. Uh, And many more. What are your life verses? Because they're going to be connected to vision for your life. They're not unconnected. There's a reason the Holy Spirit has, has highlighted those for you. Number three, when I say amen, what do you think I'm talking about? So be it, but what are you so being it to? Promises. For no matter how many promises the Lord has given, they are all yes in Christ. And through him we say the amen. Amen. God has given you promises throughout your life, sometimes to you directly, sometimes through the people around you. But if you're not compiling these, this is one thing I love about Patrick. I love to be around Patrick because he is... He's a sponge. He doesn't want to miss anything. It can be just a regular conversation and something will be said. He said, wait, 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 what did you just say? I need to write that down. He's a great steward of the things God is saying to him. And I, I need to be more like that. We all need to be stewarding well the promises of God because we're, we're quick to forget. How many times in the Old Testament does the Bible say, these things I'm telling you, Tell your kids, tell your grandkids, put them on your forehead, put them on the mantle of your door. Tell the next generation because we're prone to forget. It's not just that we're prone to forget. The enemy is prone to give us diversions so that we're not thinking about that. We need to meditate on the word of God and meditate on the promises he's given to you and me. I recommend everybody get you a little dreams book. Or you start things, writing down things that you're dreaming about with God and intersperse that with promises he's given you. Um, Number four, seeds. There are seeds of destiny in your life that God's been planting since day one. Since you were in the crib, (laughs) he was planting seeds for your life. Those seeds might be dreams that you've had over your life. They might be words that people have said to you, prophetic words. Uh, Remember, don't treat the prophecies with contempt. Have any of you ever had someone give you a prophetic word and you kind of inside, you're rolling your eyes, you think, oh, thank you. You're like, oh, false prophet. And then a few years later, you realize that was, oh, that really was a word from God. Has that ever happened to anybody or just me? Okay. Don't treat the prophecies, prophecies with contempt but test the prophecies. Those are the bookends to prophetic words we've been given. Um, Where do you see fruit in your life? That's included in the seeds for your life. Seeds are meant to produce fruit. So where have you seen fruitfulness in your life? That's going to be a part of it. Um, What issues, if you look back when, even when you're younger, what are some issues that, that were important that drew your attention That's a part, that's a key for your vision statement. Number five, timeline. We could do do two hours on that alone. I'm going to give you a 30-second overview. (laughs) I love to be able to condense because I usually am doing the opposite. Timeline of your life is where you break down your life. It's it's easiest when you break it down into decades. You break down decades and then... Over here on the left, you have several col- uh, Wait, which one's a column, which one's a row? Which one is sideways? Right. Row, okay. You have several rows. You put down, where did you live? Okay, when I was 17, we moved here. When I was 23, I got out of college and I moved here. You write down your jobs that you've had through your life. You write down key relationships that you've had in your life, both positive and negative, but relationships that were very impactful and shaping for your life. Write, write down those relationships. Write down skills that you learned. Um, write down schools that you went to. Okay, I was at elementary school, then I was at this high school, graduated here, went to this college or whatever. Um, but notice the key moments where there was a shift in your life. And what was the events, the key events in your life that changed your life from who you were here to here? 
I wrote, wrote a post last week for December 7th. I, I can't, I'm old enough to where I can't not think of Pearl Harbor on December 7th. That was one of the stories that just electrified me as a kid. And I wrote in my Facebook post about how, how that event brought America from one era into another. It was a different world after December 7th. It was a different world after September 11th. Would you agree? There's so many key events in history that things shift. Well, it's the same for your life. Identify those catalytic moments where there was a shift, where something changed. Maybe it was a stupid thing you did and the fruit of that. Maybe it was an awesome thing that you did and the fruit of that. But a timeline for your life, the reason for doing a timeline is very simple. It will help you see the thread of God's faithfulness amidst your unfaithfulness. And that's what helps you have faith that God is not going to abandon the work he started in you for the rest of your life. All right. Number six is your gifts. Now, last week we did a motivational gifts test. There are many other tests, and I can give you... A list of those. See me afterwards. I'll give you several that I, I've found to be really helpful. The DISC test, uh, Myers-Briggs, uh, Strengths Finder, on and on and on. And anytime I hear about one, I want to do it because each one has given me another facet of who I am. I got a pretty good idea about now of who I am. And each time I do one of these, I don't go like, well, I already know. Tell me something I don't know. I go like, please show me something I haven't seen yet. And so I had, and there's something called Career Direct. There's, I, I've done all these things, and I love all of them because they're helping me understand what's in my kitchen. If you remember my analogy from last week, when you get saved, God gives you a kitchen. He says, make me a meal. Well, to make a meal, you need to know what's in your kitchen. Today, for the family from Canada, it was spaghetti and pizza. <laughs> Leftover pizza from last night. We went to pizza. Okay, so... It's not about just understanding your gifts. Gifts. It's about identifying, I, I would add to the gifts there, your passions. What are you passionate about? Whether you think of it as hobbies or career things, don't put those in separate categories. Because if you're choosing to spend your time doing something, whether it's in a job or in a hobby, then it's, it's on your heart for a reason. Identify your hobbies, your skills, your passions and dreams, um, and, and another thing to include in that, take note of the things that people have affirmed in you over the years. You know, you're really good at that. Take note of those things because very more often than not, it's God speaking through them to you to help you see something. My mom used to tell me when I was a kid, she said, I think you'd be a great teacher. And I'm like, mother, you know, <laughs> mom's no best. She just didn't know it was going to be in YWAM and, and out, in and out of YWAM. So take note of things people have affirmed in you, whether you agreed with it or you thought, oh, no, that's not true. Listen to those because the Lord would speak to you through other people all the time. Values. Have values for your life. Your vision statement is a reflection of your values. Now, I could... I'm going to read this like, you know those commercials for something? And at the very end, they go, not available. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try and do that real quick. These are some values that, that I wrote out that are important for me. Loyalty, creativity, structure, diversity, integrity, teachability, joy, inclusiveness, honoring authority, listening, freedom, family, physical health, spiritual disciplines, friendships, hospitality, being informed, music, free time, problem solving, clear communication, discipleship, honesty, mercy, generosity, encouragement, truth. <sighs> what are your values? What do you value in your life? Do you ever stop to think about that? Because subconsciously you do. Your decisions are made from what you value. Your values come from your beliefs. So what do you believe is true? Your values will reflect that. Number eight is mentoring. Be one and have one or more. I love to ask people, like, 
groups of students or whatever, or not just in students in YWAM, but any group, I'll say, how many of you would like an older, wiser, godly person uh, who's, you know, who walked with God forever to speak into your life, to, to give wisdom to you, and you could pray with them and talk to them, talk through decisions. How many of you would like that? They all raise their hand. I said, put your hands down. Now, how many of you already are doing that to someone younger than you? And nobody raises their hand. I said, that's like a little bird in the nest. Feed me, feed me. I don't care about anybody else. Just feed me. You want a mentor in your life? Be a mentor. If you got saved five minutes ago, you've got something that people around you need from God already. Don't think you got to be 80 years old and, you know, or 91 in Papa Don's case. Okay, maybe then I'll be ready to mentor somebody's life. Because you'll never be ready enough. Share what you've got now. And by the way, mentoring is not just this way and this way. It's also this way. You've, you've heard about my group of guys I pray with the Eagles Feast. I'm not their age by a lot. But let me tell you what, guys. I mean, you might think on the outset, oh, I'm mentoring them. Heck no. They're mentoring me. They got a lot more to teach me than I got to teach them. And a good, healthy mentoring relationship looks like both giving to the others. In your lifetime, you need the Pauls in your life, you need the Barnabases, and you need the Timothys at any moment in your life. And oh, by the way, you don't just need one mentor who is the, uh, is it Yoda? Hmm? Mentor you need? Not, not that. You don't need one being, uh, see all to be all or whatever, be all to end all <laughs> mentor who can help you with everything. You need different kinds of mentors for different areas of your life. You need a financial mentor. You need a relational mentor. You need a career mentor. You need a gardening mentor if you got a garden. You need mentors in so many different areas of your life. And, and for that to happen, you've got to pursue it sometimes. And you've got to steward well what God gives you, the people that he's put around you. This family from Canada that, I, that just left uh, this afternoon that, were, that were, uh, I was with the last four days, they have two twin 15-year-old sons. And last night we ate at, or two nights ago we ate at Puckett's downtown. They loved it. It was so good. And after the meal was over, we just sat down and I just, you know, for 30 minutes, those teenage boys ain't going nowhere because I'm talking destiny. And I, I, I love that. I just, I don't want to miss an opportunity to plant seeds. That's what mentoring is. Is, is, is being a fertile soil to receive seeds, but also realizing you got seeds to plant in others that need it. Okay. You guys at home with us? Okay. Number nine, serve. You want to be released into the things God has for your life? Then serve other people. Give and it'll be given to you, right? Look for leaders or people that have something that you need. Something, even if you don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but you got something and I want it. Now, some of you have heard the story of me uh, when I first came here. I knew nothing of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, it was like being a new Christian again after going to church three times a week all my life. All of a sudden, it was like starting over. And I was growing like a teenage boy who didn't fit the jeans you bought a month ago because I was encountering the Holy Spirit, and every week was, was a change. And I'm hearing Papa Don, and I'm sitting in the back row of the balcony because all the crazy people are down front on the floor. And I would be like this, like everybody knows he's talking about me. Find out later, everybody felt that way too. And I started praying, God, I don't know what Don Fento has, but I need it. I, please give me some opportunity to serve him, Lord. I, I, I don't care what, God. Have me carry his bags or something. I just, I just need whatever it is he's got. Because he's the closest thing to, he's the one who's introduced me to you as father. So I need what he has. And I prayed that and I didn't tell people. I was praying that for quite a while. And one Wednesday night after church, Don comes up to me. He says, uh, hey, Joseph, I've got a, you know, a quick two-day trip coming up. And uh, I wondered if you might like to come with me on that trip. I'm like, Really? I said, what do you want me to do? 
He said, well, I don't know. I thought maybe you could carry my bags for me or something. I thought, shoot, I should ask more than bags. You know? So guys, if you want to be released in what God has for you, then you serve other people in what God has for them. Give and it'll be given to you. Number 10, communicate. Pursuing your vision and putting your, em, employing your vision, I'll say it that way, or um, igniting or charging your vision or releasing your vision, whatever you want to call it, uh, that involves clear communication, both internal and external. Internal is communicating with the people around you that, that you trust, people that you trust their words to you, for them to speak into your life. They're going to have pieces you don't have by God's design. All of the people that you most need, all of the things you most need, God didn't give it all to you. He spread it around in the people around you. So that if you are humble enough to receive, then they will, they will be faithful to give you what God gave them to give you. Right? So when you communicate, communicate to the people that you're in relationship with, that you're connected to, you're, you're close, you know, your hood. Um, but also external is communicating to the people that are um, going to be recipients of your vision. Learn to communicate well your vision. And we'll see about your vision. It's, it needs to be easy to remember so that you can communicate clearly your, division, your vision to other people. Number 11 is partnerships. Strategic partnerships. No man is an island. You cannot do the things God has envisioned for your life by yourself. And it's a humbling thing to say to people, I need you. I, I can't do this without your help. And there are partnerships that God has already planned for every season of your life because he knows how many seasons there are because he's got the days of your life numbered before the first one starts, right? So he's got partnerships. Maybe it's the partnership, he's, I'm thinking like of a ministry, like my tribe right now is YWAM for the last 25 years. I, I'm very comfortable. I know how to move and groove in YWAM. It's my tribe. There are many tribes out there. It's not just ministries. This, this stuff is for every believer, guys. Don't think this is just for people in ministry. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to have a vision for your life. Period. End of story. So, there are partnerships that you're supposed to team with. You have a part for a team. It's kind of like when Rachel was teaching about calls, she was talking about how Belmont had a calling and how our, if God's called you to Belmont, then you have a part to play in the overall Belmont vision, right? So think about the partnerships that you will need for your vision to be completed. Number 12, enemies. John 10.10, 10, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. You need to know that Satan is terrified of you latching on to your vision for your life. And he will do everything in his power to stop it. Two months ago when I was preaching, I gave a long list of obstacles that, that will, will stop you from getting your vision. Go back and, and listen to that at the very end of that. But Satan has specific obstacles for each one of us. I don't know how, but he knows exactly where to attack you. Maybe it's because he was in heaven before the earth was created and God thought of us before creation. Um, but I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Moses, what was, oh, I'm not supposed to go beyond the poinsettia <laughs> that I almost killed last week, but someone with the gift of healing prayed and it's still here. Um, what was the greatest event I would say two possible ones, but what, tell me one of the greatest events of Moses' life. Mm, well, that was a catalyst for what? Bring the Israelites out of Egypt. I mean, moving three to five million people out of slavery from 400 years. 
That's kind of a big event. The other one I would say would be the Ten Commandments. But getting the Israelites out, well, now that was a calling on his life before he was even born and put in a basket on the Nile River in the thrushes. By the way, I've been in Cairo on a felucca boat, which is made the same way they've been made for 3,000 years in the rushes of the Nile River, right where it's opening, about to open out to the Mediterranean. And I'm looking in there to see if there's any baskets of babies. <laughs> it was the most awesome feeling to be there. And so now I have a visual to go with that with the story. So that was Moses calling. So what did, what did Satan try to do with all the babies? Kill them. But God had a bigger plan. All right, so what was Jesus' greatest calling? I'll give you a hint. It's the same as Moses, but spiritually. To get us about our spiritual Egypt into our spiritual promised land. And Satan, who is so unoriginal, what did he try to do to the babies? Kill the babies. I've been to Bethlehem, and with a YWAM buddy, we had a morning free on an outreach there. And uh, there is a church supposedly built where the manger was, over the manger. Who knows? But we do know it's, it is definitely Bethlehem. It's been a consistently occupied city since before Jesus was born. So within a few miles... I'm where the, you know, the manger was somewhere in spitting distance of that, right? And so we're going there, middle of the day, nobody's around, and bright, sunny day, and there, not far from the church, off from the courtyard, there was this steel gate, and it was open. Well, one thing about me, I love to go through doors. I mean, not like Superman, but I'm just curious. I've gotten embarrassed many a time from that habit. So... I said to my buddy, Matt from Australia, I said, hey, Matt, why don't we go down? He says, yeah. So we go down, not one, but three long sets of stairs carved straight out of stone, way down, like several stories down below the street level. Everything down there was carved out of solid stone. And in the back, there's a, there was a room, a very small room, and it had a marble table coming out from the wall, and it was stained. And then on the floor, there was a, a starburst with an eternal flame and a plaque in Hebrew, which we did not understand. We didn't know what happened, but we knew something major happened there. What I didn't tell you was that in the hallway going down to that room, there were display cases on each side. And you know what was in them? The skulls of many little babies. I've seen the skulls. It really happened. You see, Satan, if he can't kill you in the womb, he's going to try and kill you soon after. He's going to start trying to uh, poison your life to steal, kill, and destroy because he's afraid of you stepping into what God has for you. When I was a kid, you know what my greatest fear was? You'll laugh. Public speaking. I had an insane fear of public speaking. I'd be in high school. I was so glad my last name was W. If we were seated alphabetically in English class and we're each reading a sentence or a paragraph, I would count and find which paragraph was mine and try to read it enough so I could memorize it. So when it was my turn, I didn't go. <laughs> and I wanted the earth to swallow me up. Now I can't shut up. But why did the enemy try to give me that fear from early on in life? Because he knew God wanted me to talk in this way. So whatever God has called for you, somehow Satan is eagle-eyeing what God has for you. And he's got very specific plans. He's not going to trip you up the same way he's going to trip other people up. He knows what will trip you up. He knows you because he lived in you for a while. He knows how you think, and he knows how to mimic and imitate God and be a ventriloquist and make you think it's words of God when it's the enemy. How many know that's true? Be aware of your own potential weak areas that the enemy can prey upon and capitalize on. Don't deny them. Don't try to act like they're not there. Identify them. 
be, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the enemy's schemes. Be aware of how he has and continues to want to attack you. Number 13, key for, for vision is, is risk. Your faith will not grow unless it's stretched. Your faith does not grow without stretching. And if you don't have dreams that require a risk, a risk of failure, a risk of looking stupid to the world, they're not a dream worth having. And what's involved in risk is also being willing to pay the price. You look at any successful person, big name person, uh, the Elon Musks of the world or the, you know, long list of people that we would put in that category of super successful people. You ask every single one of them, did you ever have failures in your life? They will laugh at you. So are you kidding? How do you think I got to where I'm at? Because the failures are your best teachers. So when you take a risk, it means you're willing to fail, but your eyes are on the Lord and knowing that if you fail, God is going to teach you something you couldn't have learned any other way. Be willing to take risks. And number 14, kingdom. If your vision is not connected to extending the kingdom of heaven, then throw it away, go far away from whatever you think is a vision. If your vision is intended to be connected with extending the Father's kingdom. If the vision statement you end up with either tonight or you know, in the days or weeks to come, if the statement you end up with does not encapsulate how you want to see the kingdom of heaven advance through you, it's not a vision worth having. It's just, it's not an eternal vision. I talked about last week or in one of the times I preached about how God's dream is, is for the whole earth to be covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And that's like a big pizza, since I have pizza on the brain now. His, his pizza is that, that every arena of society, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, arts, entertainment, sports, business, church, media, but to make it start with D, distribution of information, education, Family, government, healthcare, medicine, science, and technology. Jesus is coming back and he wants to see evidence of the kingdom of heaven in all eight arenas of society, of every society on earth. And, he, and we're sitting there thinking, what do you want me to do? He says, like, what, what piece of pizza do you want me to eat? I'm like, what are you hungry for? You want Hawaii and I'll give it to you. You want meat lovers? You got it. You want one of those fancy... White pizzas with, I don't know, Alfredo and spinach. You got it. What do you want? And we're freaking out because we've misunderstood who he is and we've not seen the freedom that he's given us. Vision statement is not about finding out what is God's work duty for me. That's what religious orphans do. Vision statement is something that sons and daughters can, can latch on to and be like a flint. You know, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, it said he set his face like a flint. He was a man of destiny and purpose, and he was going straight toward what God had for, for him, and nothing was going to stop him. And he says, follow me. You live like I did. You live with a kingdom focus. You live to complete the Father's work on earth. That's what your vision has to tap into. Okay. Does that make sense? Let's take a break. Five minutes. You guys at home? Are you okay? Yes? Okay, good. We see you. We believe in you.
Okay, are we about ready to get back? All right, is God speaking to any of you yet? I hope he's speaking to you. He's always speaking to me when I'm teaching. Y'all just get to hear it too. All right. Now this part two, we're going to look at the actual nuts and bolts of writing your vision statement. And by the way, you know what? If you're a teacher, pizza boxes make great display things. <laughs> See, isn't this awesome? Um, I didn't have to buy a poster board or anything. Okay, I have talked before about finding the sweet spot of your life. The sweet spot of your life is where three circles intersect. The little triangle they make in the middle is your sweet spot of life. It's where your calling, which is talking about not what you do, but who you're called to. Your ministry, which answers the what and where questions. And your giftings, which answers the how questions. You're called to people. Now, on that called sheet, which I think somewhere, maybe over here, it, it, it will tell you there's a lot of different ways that you could find your calling. Maybe you're called to a people group, like an unreached people group somewhere. Maybe you feel called to a career group. Whatever your career is, you want to reach other people in your career. Maybe you feel called to a, um, the disenfranchised of society. Refugees, homeless, um, widows, prisoners, um, people in halfway houses, drug addicts. You know, the people that are, we consider on the fringe of the rest of society, you have a heart for them. Maybe you feel called to a religious group. You got a real heart for Muslims or Jewish people, or Mormons, or Buddhists, or Hindus, or fill in the blank, New Agers. Or maybe you're like me, you're called to a generation. 17 to early 30s, they're mine. And so you already know who you're called to. People say, no, I don't, I'm clueless. I said, no, you know, you just don't know that you know that you know. Because once the penny drops, you're like, Oh, yeah, it's been this for a long time. I just didn't, it was right in front of me. I just never saw it. So this is basically like working on your, your sweet spot. Your calling is who is the receiver. And when you think about this group that you feel called to, that you're burdened on your heart for, what are their needs? You don't just think, oh, I like, you know, I'm called to Hollywood celebrities. Well, (laughs) you need prayer. So uh, maybe you are. Maybe you are. I'm not dissing that. People at home, please strike that from the record. Okay. The receiver is who you're called to. But when you in in this in the same breath that you're realizing, oh, this is these are the people I've called to. What are the needs that they have? That's why God has burdened you for that people because they have needs that you are called to help meet. You can't just think about a group and just, oh, okay, I'm thinking about a group. No, if your heart is for that group, then your, heart, your eyes are going to be drawn to whatever it is that their needs are. All right, the action is what are you going to do about those needs? Needs. That's the circle of, of ministry, What are you going to do with them? And this action involves verbs. Verbs are the action words in our language, right? We communicate. If if there there were no verbs in our language, I I can't even imagine. You know, every sentence has to have a verb or it's not a sentence. It's just a phrase. So the action is the ministry circle of this sweet spot thing, this Celtic looking thing. All right, let's hold on to the results for a minute. The how is referring to your gifting circle. How you, 10 people could do the same thing and it'll look 10 different ways because no two people are wired exactly the same. They're, they're gifted differently. Their lives have different journeys. We all, we all are, 
We're so infinitely unique, we have no idea. And the enemy is all the time trying to water down or make us feel that we need to be somebody else. We haven't even learned to embrace the incredible, glorious uniqueness that God put in us when he thought it was for creation and when he knit us together with excitement and joy and the angels sang and rejoiced and we're thinking we're not what we should be. Or, or maybe if I were more like them, it would be cooler. And God's going, ay, ay, ay. Probably close to that. All right. These are the three circles. The receiver is your calling. Who are you called to? The action is the ministry. What do you do with them? The how is your giftings package. But your vision statement takes it one step for, further. The, the sweet spot, identifying your sweet spot at life, in life is kind of like grabbing hold to who, this is who I am. But the vision statement is saying, because this is who I am, this is the path I'm taking. This is the arrow that my life is going to take. And I'm drawing the bullseye because I'm going for it. So your vision statement needs to include these elements. All right? So now, just to... Uh, wait, I can't get out of the camera. Sorry, people at home. Uh, I'm going to show you my vision statement. Uh, let's see if I can do this. I don't, I don't have a Vanna White here to uh, turn vowels for me. Anybody want to buy a vowel? All right. Here's my vision statement. By the way, I'm not showing this as, okay, here's the perfect example of what a vision statement should be. I'm saying this is perfect for me. Oh, I left the black one at home. Oh, well. That's it. It's, some of it's kind of whatever. All right. Can you see it back there? Everybody see it? All right. Here's my vision statement. I am called to demonstrate sonship in the nations, stirring up emerging generations to claim or to release kingdom dreams and claim their spiritual inheritance in every arena of society as God's children, using creativity, teaching, and communication that inspires. This is me. Now, could I have a different statement later? Sure. There could be new things that develop. There could be new experiences, new seasons that God brings more revelation of something. But for right now, this is pretty close to what I got. Now, I've got all these other colored markers here. I want you to look at this with this in mind. And I want you to tell me, who is the receiver that my vision statement is pointing to? Emerging generations. All right, so I put an R for receiver there. Emerging generations. And by the way, where are they? In the nations. So we're going to include that in the nations, okay? That's the receiver for my vision. All right, what is the action of my vision? Demonstrate. Demonstrate. That's one. What's another one? Huh? Teaching. Teaching, you could use that in there, even though it's, a, it's another kind of verb where it's ing, whatever you call that. Stirring, stirring up. Those, that's my action. All right? What are the results? Release kingdom dreams is part of it. And? What? What, what did you, what were you saying? Inspire. Inspire. Okay, I don't have that in there. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't even think about that verb. You, yes, and amen. Sonship. What? Sonship. Okay, um, yes, yes, I would say yes, okay. I, I'm going to say claim their spiritual inheritance. 
Yes, but th this is a part of the uh, results. Our S for results. Okay. And what about the how? Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so this gets a double thing. Teaching, communication, that inspires, and creativity. Okay, does that make sense? So your vision statement, it needs, it needs to include these four things. All right? Okay, now... You've got this on hand on a handout, but I'm gonna. Um, oh, there's two little things sticking out. That's awesome. All right, your vision statement needs five things. It needs to be one sentence. Why? Yes, easy to remember. You know, we struggle to memorize a Bible verse. Well, if you've got a vision statement that's like way long. Now, let me, let me say something real quick. Different people use different terminology. Papa Don has got something he calls his vision statement, which is a page long. And it is, it, of course, it's going to be exemplary. It's like massively awesome. But it's really long. It takes him about five, seven minutes to, to, to tell it. I would call that a passion statement. And this is the vision statement. The passion statement is like a, a, a huge summary. And the vision statement is like, okay, I'm going to take, take all of this summary and I'm going to it, put it in one bullet. Does that make sense? So your vision statement is, is, is bringing it in to, to something that is directed. So it needs to be one sentence, easy to remember. Because if you don't, can't remember, don't expect anybody else to. Simple to understand. Not complicated. Inspiring to you and other people. Every time I do my vision statement, I get a charge out of it. Because it's a reminder to me of what God has given me. And it brings me joy. And I want other people to have joy for their life. I don't want them to be like me. They're not made like me. I am jealous for them to find out what God's put in them and become that. That's my joy. You know, I talk about dreaming with God, and I've got 4,100 dreams. If you look at my memo notes on my iPhone, I have over 2,500 notes. And a chunk of those are ideas, and I get, it's like losing hair. It's so easy for me. I've just got so many, many, many. And people say, well, have you done all that yet? I said, no, not yet. I said, but my number one, you know what my number one dream is? Getting other people to dream. And I get to see that every day. So if the other stuff happened, that's just going to be icing on the cake. I already got the cake. So if your vision doesn't inspire you, why should it inspire anybody else? And when it does inspire you, I'm going to kill a plant here if I'm not careful. When it does inspire you, you know what it's going to inspire them to do? Find vision for their life and inspire others. Exactly. So your vision needs to be inspirational. If not, why are you on the planet? You're just taking up oxygen from everybody else. And finally, it needs to apply to every area of your life. I, I can't think of an area of my life that's not in this. This is me. All right, some of you guys that have known me, Patrick, Vicky, would you say this captures me? It's, it's me. I love this. This is like a favorite pair of jeans that you put on. What's your pair of jeans? Find it. Now, Okay, we're doing good on time. Praise the Jesus. You know why you say the Jesus? Because there's a lot of Jesuses in Mexico, and I want to make sure you know I'm talking about the Jesus. Okay, so if I can get some wonderful people to help me pass these out. Um, this is a list of about 300 verbs. It's two pages. Everybody gets two pages, a front and a back, and then fronts, Okay. 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. When <laughs> Patrick and Liliana both were servers from last week, and they were, they were helping me turn them sideways. Uh, you guys at home, uh, I'm sure this will be on the website. Yes, it is. He says with questionable faith. Okay. And I got the confirmation, yes. So it's a list of 300 verbs, and these verbs are going to help you to start jump-starting your thinking, okay? So, your vision statement, it needs to include action, right? Verbs are action verbs. So here's what I want you to do with this list of 300-something verbs. I want you to go through and pick out 20 that feel like you. Go through and find 20 of them that you say, I, you know, for some reason that really draws me. Yes, that, that verb is me. Okay? So pull out tw 20 verbs from that list of 400, uh, 300 or 200 something. I don't know how many there were. It's a lot. Did you guys get one? No. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Cool beans. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Deborah. Question. So the thing about the arrow as he drew the Yes. Okay, so on the part about um, the receiver. So that's us like that, and we draw the full sign the receiver. I would say it like this. The, the arrow is your vision statement. And you're saying, I know that I'm going to hit the bullseye because I'm the one deciding my bullseye. Does that make sense? For those of you at home, I'm sorry that I can't read out 300-something verbs for you. But uh, maybe you could just think of verbs that sound like you. See how many you can write down that seem to be you. Ah, you can download it from the church website, belmont.org. Good. Thank you for doing that. If you've just tuned in, we are looking at a lot of verbs and picking out 20 verbs from a long list that sound like us. What was it Peter said on Pentecost? We're not crazy as you might think. Lift your vision higher, higher than it's been before. Sing carols. Huh? Sing some carols. Sing carols. You know, it's hard if you're gifted in one of these verb areas. It's not just like a choose a in that, in that <laughs> section. Just... 
Well, that's good. That means that <clears throat> you're learning to narrow down and hone in your vision. Okay, if you go to the homepage of Belmont.org, which is different from what you're watching on Belmont.tv, go to Belmont.org and you'll see it somewhere right there on the homepage. Three down, she said. Mm -hmm. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your nose, Yuletide carols being sung by a choir, and folks dressed up like Eskimos. Everybody knows some turkey and some mistletoe help to keep the season's pride. We aim to please here. Tiny tots with their eyes all aglow will find it hard to sleep tonight. They know that Santa's on his way. He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh. And every mother's child is gonna spy to see if reindeer really know how to fly. And so I'm offering this Christ Christmas prayer to kids from 1 to 92. Although it's been said many times, many ways, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. For some of you that helped, for some of you it was probably a distraction, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> sure <laughs> yeah, that wasn't trying to influence your verbs. Ooh, it just got really cold up here for some reason. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is how an advertiser may do a brand ad for uh, exactly how they do it. She was just saying this is how in, a, in advertising they do a branding. Brand ad, like they decide on what their taglines are and what their... Oh. How they do a brand amp, how they make the brand, you know, determine what is the brand all about and kind of thing. Yeah. All right. How you doing? How many got 20 yet? <laughs> we wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. You wish that I wouldn't sing now. You wish... <laughs>
raise your hand when you finish. Okay. Just a handful. Okay. Even the act of doing that is helpful for you to start thinking. Lovely. Whistle, whistling stereo. <laughs> or stereo whistling. Okay, raise your hand if you're finished now. All right, most everybody. Okay. All right. You're not going to like what I'm going to ask you to do next. Take your list of 20. And narrow it down to three. If I told you to do three from the start, that would have been a lot harder. So you're just having to do three out of 20. It's a lot easier. No. <laughs> you know. So you guys at home, first you do 20 from the list. Then you narrow down and pick three out of those 20. If your high motivational, or no, sorry, if your high learning style is linguistic, it'll be harder for you. But if you're not highly linguistic, it'll be easy. Yeah. Just three, pick them out. Linguistic people are like, oh, I've got to examine every single one of these 300 and something to find the right one. <laughs> That's another thing we could do learning styles sometime. Yeah. It is, because you're picking three out of 20 instead of 20 out of two or 300. I'm sure. I have no doubt, Vicki. <laughs> if you got your three, raise your hand. Let's see how far we're doing. Okay, getting there. All right, if you've got your three, I'm going to go I'm going to go ahead and tell you the next part. And those of you that are... Still working on your three, you, you open one ear to hear this and you keep going. Try your hand at writing your statement. 
started out with, I am called to. And you got, you know, the backside of your second page is free. Start, start experimenting around. I am called to. Again, think about who you're called to. Your action or these verbs you just now thought about. What results, you know, what needs do you want to meet for the people you're called to? And how do you want to do it? All right. All right you don't need to see mine anymore. I'm going to put this over here. Yes, sir. Oh, I got a pen. Oh, they're over there. Okay. Can I read you a vision statement from someone else? Did I read this last week? I don't think so. Oh, I was talking to some people after the thing last week, and I read it. This is a vision statement from the lovely Arya Wathke. This is an awesome vision statement. And if you did not know this about her, you would be like, really? You know? All right, check this out. I am called to analyze criminal justice systems of the nations and execute kingdom of God principles that will pierce the hearts of criminals with God's all-consuming fire so that they become vessels of transformation through my gifts of assertiveness, efficiency, and sympathetic boldness. That's a mic drop vision statement right there. I know, nor me. I feel sorry. What was it, Mr. T said? I pity the fool. I, <laughs> whoever this thinks. <laughs> and by the way, when we finish, I would love, if you don't mind, I would love for you to send me your vision statements. And, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I am free after tonight to, to, um, Help any of uh, any of you. If you want more help to narrow it down, whatever. I love helping p- people do this because I'm a wordsmith and I love to help people narrow. This this is me. I want I want to help people find their laser thing. So please send me your statements, or if you have questions or you need help, let me know. I'm gun for hire. Okay. I'm going to give you about, I know this is quick, but this, I'm giving you tools and you can do this after you leave as well. You don't have to, you know, you're not graded in heaven by what you write in the next seven minutes, okay? But I'm going to give you about seven minutes until five till, and then I'm going to get you to get with one other person and you guys talk together. If you've got your statement, then read it to the other one and get their feedback, don't worry if you're not finished tonight, guys. Don't, don't sweat it because this is a, you know, I didn't come up with mine in this amount of time. I'm asking you to do it in either. Uh, it came from teaching it and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking uh, to get where it is now. So try hard to make it one sentence. Or no, make it one sentence.
know what would be fun? Is to write Jesus' vision statement for when he came to earth. Now put that in one sentence. Ooh, that would be hard. I kind of would like to be somewhere in his vision statement. I'm called to rescue Joseph and other people. Some, something like that. That's a work in progress. I'll let you know when I finish. <laughs> Again, I'll remind you, think about who your receiver is. Who are you called to? What are their needs? What do you want to do about it? And how can you uniquely do those things? Who are you called to? Right here. Okay, who are you called to? What are their needs? What do you want to do about it? And how are you going to do it? About two more minutes, I'm going to ask you to get with someone else. Even, don't worry if you're not finished. This is just a, tonight's just a introduction. Get you started. You guys see me at church and say, hey, Joseph, read this. What do you think? I will be extremely happy if you do that. And I'll be happy to help. even if your generation emerged quite a while before. <laughs> Let me just ask this question. For how many is this encouraging to be working on this? Does it feel like, oh wow, God's got something for me. And I get to be a partner with God in it. It's not like I'm just, give me the job to do and I'll do it. It's the joy of co-partnering with God. Give you about one more minute. Would you rather keep writing and not pair up? Yeah. All I know is we are definitely going to stop the, rec the online at 8. I can stay here all night long. Uh, y all, y all, y if y'all got to go, you can go whenever you want. You can stay as long as you want, and I'll answer questions as long as you want. Um, but I think that might be better to just keep writing on your own because... You know, you haven't really had enough to, but if you can stay, then don't leave without 
getting some feedback from somebody else, bouncing off of each other what you get. The more general you make your vision statement, the harder it is to fulfill it. When it's general, you're shooting at a cloud. When it's specific, you're shooting at a hay bale on a tripod. Bingo. You're thinking about your, your specific calling from God. And it's not like there's this magical thing and God is going to grade you if you don't get it exactly right. We have a whole lot of freedom in that. You know, he says, anywhere you put your foot, I'll give it to you. He says, what part of the pie do you want? He says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. We have so much more freedom than we realize. And yet we let the enemy put us in a box. That 10% is about saying, God, I'm recognizing what you've given me, and it's this. You put this on my heart. Hey, Dad, can we do this together? And he's like, absolutely. Because he says, ask me for anything in my name according to my Father's will, and it will be given to you. It says Psalm 2.8, ask me for the nations as your inheritance. The ends of the earth is your possession. What part of his magnificent pie do you want as yours? And one thought I forgot to say earlier, I'm going to throw it out here. The, remember the last thing on my list of keys for your vision statement was kingdom. And we talk about the great commandment. What is the greatest commandment according to Jesus? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He was quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Well, the great commandment, you cannot fulfill the greatest commandment without including the great commission. That's why I say your vision statement must have at the core about fulfilling God's dream, about bringing his kingdom on earth. You get to choose. Do you want to bring it in the arts? Do it. You want to bring it in government? Do it. You want to bring it in, you know, coaching football? Do it. We think career in geography is what matters most to God. What matters most to God is our heart. Everywhere you put your foot, I'll give it to you. He's saying, my dream, you could go anywhere in the world with any kind of people group. Or, he says, I... Do you think I'm going to quibble that if you're, you know, reaching bowlers for Jesus? No, I want you to be with the Uyghur people. Who, who do you think God is? We've been given this incredible freedom. And when we don't walk in freedom, we don't inspire others to walk in freedom. When we don't walk as people of vision, we don't impart that we don't release that we don't inspire that and if and we are called to be visionary people God sees the end from the beginning and calls things that are not as so they as though they are and we're supposed to do the same isn't that what faith is it's the evidence of what you don't see but things the assurance of what you hope for that's what faith looks like calling things that are not as though they are and when you have a vision statement for your life your life is tying into that I wish I had a picture of Charlie Brown to give all of you where he's doing that okay one minute till eight I'm going to be faithful to that eight o'clock thing after torturing you last week okay questions Anybody got some questions bubbling up? Are you asleep? Are you stunned? Yes. Is, is it helpful to 
No. Can you not incorporate that in your vision statement? All right. One thing we don't have time to go into, your vision statement, um, for it to be fulfilled, you have to have goals, strategic ways this is going to happen. You know, the, it, there's, there's like a further breaking it down. Um, applicable to all areas of your life. All right, so I, I'm, I'm called to use create. I use creativity, teaching, and communication that inspires. Okay, what does that look like in the natural? Well, it means me connecting with YWAM bases and churches that I'm going to speak to or whatever group, whatever kind of group. It means connecting communication-wise, one of the keys to the vision thing, right? It means partnerships, another thing on the keys to the vision statement. It means the, the nuts and bolts of making the vision happen. If you're going to shoot an arrow or a laser gun, well, you've got to sharpen your... No, you don't sharpen laser. You, you're you going to adjust the, 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 the make sure it's lined up with where you want to go. You're going to make sure all the mechanism of your laser gun is working. I mean, there's the nuts and bolts. There's the breaking it down further and more and more specific. And, and like I was saying to Vicki, the more specific you make your vision statement, the easier it is to pursue it. When you make it general, I mean, I've had people write one. It sounded like they were applying to be Jesus. And I was like, that job's taken. I mean, it was so broad. It was, it was like, you know, Miss America, I want world peace. Can you be more specific? You know, I want to see the conflict in this place stopped. Okay, how? Okay, well, that means I need to understand these people's concerns and these people's concerns. Okay, it also means I need to understand the history of the area. It means I need to, all right, kind of what practically? I mean, you understand what I'm saying? You, when, you, when you're fleshing out your vision statement, it involves going deeper and deeper, you know, more logistically, more specific to where it's like, gosh, this laser is going straight where I want it to go. Yes. And in my situation, it came from being involved with students in a classroom to running schools to coming down and then after retirement, focusing, feeling like I had learned a lot to focus my attention on those with addictions. Yeah. 